Anyway, hey, grab your Bible. We're in, uh, we're in 1 John. Adrian did a fantastic introduction for us last week, told us all about the Gnostics and the special revelations from God and all that stuff. Um, you know, when you're coming to the Scriptures... Any Bible interpretation, uh, con- they say context is king, and, and context is everything, and there's multiple contexts that you want to get a hold of. The primary one is what's being said in the passage you're reading. You don't want to just pluck a proof text. Do you remember the guy that uh, wanted to get a proof text, so he flipped the Bible open, and what did it say? Judas went out and hung himself. So he flicked it open again. What was the second one he found? Go therefore do likewise. Yeah. So if you want to get if you want to get proof text, you'll be in trouble very quickly. So what you want to do is make sure you understand the passage and what the subject matter is and what it's talking about. And then you want to understand what is the culture of the day that was being spoken to. In this case, you've got a Greco-Roman culture, and overlaid on that, you've got a Jewish culture. So good luck working that one out. Uh, but you've got to try and get some idea of what's going on there, and then you need to understand your own culture bias, and that's the hardest one to get. Um, And so when you're interpreting the Scriptures, don't let the culture of the world dictate to you how to think, because the Bible says that we need our thinking transformed by the renewing of our mind. So can't just accept the worst thing to do is to accept the culture that you were born into and say, well, that's all there is. You've got to challenge that all the time by the culture of the Word of God. And that's what happens in John. And John is very strong on challenging the culture of the time, both outside the church and inside the church. He's challenging people to think again about what this thing really means. In 1 John chapter 2, oh, before we do that, um, next Sunday night, we're having our worship night. It's really our worship and prayer night. Um, Blind Freddy, an old prophet friend of ours, used to say, Blind Freddy could tell you. So you didn't need any gifting uh, to understand it. But Blind Freddy could tell you that our church is in a new season. Blind Freddie could tell you that. God was speaking to me about that during the week and he took me back over the 30 years history of our church and sort of walked me through a few things and then he just reinforced in my spirit, it's a new season, it's a new day. There's a new thing happening. God's at work. The question is, what's he going to do in this new season, this new work? And so on Sunday night, what we're going to do is we're going to worship, we're going to pray, we're going to seek God, we're going to leave the past few years behind and we're going to step into deliberately, whatever God's got for us. that sound good? So uh, join us next Sunday night. It'll be on for young and old. Uh, we'll see what happens. It'll be fun. That's what's happening next Sunday night. Come, come with me to 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 and 11. 1 John 2, verse 9 and 11. Here we go. Last week, uh, Adrian was talking about living in light, not living in darkness. Uh, Really good. And those three points that he made, go back and have a look at it again, about how to live in the light, not to live in the darkness. Well, have a look at what John says. 1 John 2, verses 9 to 11. He says, whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Got a pretty clear measure of whether you're living in light or living in darkness. Do you hate your brother? You've got a problem in your heart. And uh, it's still in dark. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. Isn't that a good phrase? If you love your brother, you're in the light, and you're not going to stumble. That's really important to get that one in your heart. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I'm reminded that when I have to get up in the middle of the night because I'm not 30 anymore and there's reasons why older people get up in the middle of the night and those reasons are clear. And when I'm coming back to the bedroom, I have to go past one of our chairs that's in front of our door sort of thing. So I'm in the night, I can't be bothered putting lights on and stuff. So what am I doing? I'm stumbling around in the dark. And so I've got the kitchen bench there. I put my hand out. Oh, there it is there. And then boom, I run into the chair. Not anymore. I've got the idea now. I put my hand, oh, There it is. I go around it. So if you're in the darkness, you're stumbling all over the place. Your relationships are bad. You've got problems everywhere. You've got heart problems. You've got all sorts of problems going on in the darkness. But when the light comes on, you can see your way and you sort things out and you love your brother. That's what John's saying. And in John, in chapter 4 and verse 8, he says, anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Pretty clear. Anyone who does not know, who does not love does not know God. There's the measure. 
See, it's not a religious thing, is it? Our, our faith is not a, just a religious practice where you can come to church and put some money in the silver box or online or whatever you're doing and pr- pray a few prayers. I'm always reminded of my friend who would pray the Lord's Prayer every morning and then proceed to live like an absolute sinner, swearing and carrying on and living his life any way he wanted to. Yeah, really, that sort of religion is useless to you, isn't it? John is saying, hey, if you don't, if you don't love, then you don't know God. And particularly, I would say, if you don't, because Jesus said we should love those who hate us. If you don't have an attitude of grace and love, even towards those who are hateful towards you, then you probably don't know God. Because God loved us while we hated him. If we're going to reflect God, then we're going to love those who hate us. So there's a measure for the heart transformation. Now, John knew what this was about. This was not an academic exercise for John. Who remembers what James and John were called? By Jesus, nonetheless. Sons of thunder. Yeah, okay. So in Mark, in Mark 3.17, when he was naming, he was listing the uh, disciples, Mark was listing, he said, Jesus called these guys sons of thunder. Uh, it, wasn't, it, you know, it wasn't, you know, fantastic thunder from down under, sort of, you know, muscly guys that were so fantastic. No, it wasn't that. It was because they had an aggro, aggressive spirit that wasn't good. And he was identifying it. Similarly with Peter when he says, you know, get behind me, Satan. You're thinking about the things of the world, not of God. Jesus wasn't averse to putting people on the spot and saying, hey, sort this out in your life. So these guys were sons of thunder. In Luke chapter 9, if you have a look at it, here's an example. Luke 9, 51, Jesus goes to a Samaritan village on the way to Jerusalem. I'll read from verse 42. It says, He sent a message ahead of him, went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. So there's the racial conflict between the Samaritans and the Jews that's being played out. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, what? Let's pray for these people. They need salvation like everybody else. They are, let's be humble here and accept that they're having some problems and we'll see if God can touch them and soften their hearts. Is that what they said? No, because they're sons of thunder. They said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven? I'm amused by that because these were the same guys who couldn't cast the devil out of the guy and Jesus said, where's your faith? These are the same guys who are sitting in the boat fearful of of, of dying, not getting out and walking on the water. These are the same guys and suddenly they're going to call fire down from heaven like some Old Testament prophet. Now to be fair to them, they grew up in the context of the Old Testament prophets where they did call down fire from heaven. I was reminded too, some of you, it's the 40th anniversary of Youth Alive. Is anybody involved with Youth Alive? Give me a wave. All right, a few of us. Um, and I was, I was interested because one of the songs that we used to sing back then was Calling Down Fire. Calling Down Fire. You remember that one? You had to grab up and call down fire. Call down fire. And when the reference is, some, it can be the Holy Spirit, but the reference usually is God's judgment. So here's all these young people going, we're going to call down fire on, the, on ourselves, on the city, on the, on the stadium. I don't know what, but the fire was going to be called. Anyway, that's what James and John were doing. That's what they were like. And so James... Uh, Rather, John, both of them actually. John, when he came to write the Gospel of John and these letters, he had had a personal transformation. This wasn't an academic. He wasn't writing a nice little homily to the church, nice little poem saying, oh, love each other, wouldn't that be sweet? No, that wasn't what he was doing. That's why he says, if you don't love, you don't know God. Because he knew that he didn't love when he didn't know God. And when he knew God, God changed him to love people. Total transformation of his heart and life. So today we're looking at living in love. And I want you to come with me to see the transformation that he recommends that we embark on. And in 1 John 3, if you go back to 1 John, it will come on the screen, I hope, but good to have your own Bible. 1 John 3 verse 11, the first thing we need to do is recognize and accept our condition. This is why in 1 John 1, 9, John says, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. 
But if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. If you say you've got no sin, you're just deceiving yourself. The first challenge is our condition. And I'll call it the condition of Cain because that's what he uses as an example. In 1 John 3, 11 to 15, he says this, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed uh, out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderers enter eternal life, have eternal life abiding in them. He envied his, Cain envied his brother. The brother was right with God and Cain envied him and Cain killed him. Now what's, uh, John's quoting that, that story from the Old Testament, but who else is he quoting? He's quoting Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, if you have animosity in your heart towards your brother, then you, you're killing your brother in your heart. Jesus knew that all that animal, all that hatred began in the heart and then it worked out into hatred that was in the community, which is why when they came to the Samaritan village, James and John were so wrong because they were building on a historical racial animosity instead of letting the love of God transform them. When Jesus had visited the Samaritan village in John 4, what had happened? He'd found the worst sinful woman in that village and he'd led her to a real faith in God and a transformation of a soul. And they came back and said, Jesus, what are you doing talking to this woman? Because they've yet to understand that when you know God, you love people. So that was the problem with John. And he, needed, he knew that he needed to have an encounter with God to change him and transform. He needed forgiveness. If you have a look at that in Matthew chapter 5, if you want, verse 21, Jesus speaking about this. He says, You've heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. Uh, whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, You fool, will be liable to hellfire. That's pretty good, isn't it? So, so if you're offering your gift at the altar, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and bring your gift. Jesus said it's all about what's going on inside your heart. You've got to have a heart transformation. You need to have forgiveness flow. You need to have love flow in your heart. You need to recognise your own condition. I think that when we read the story of Cain and Abel, most of us would identify with Abel. Does any, anybody automatically identify with Cain? Just a little wave. Any axe murderers among us? No? Maybe a little bit up there. Yeah, there we've got one honest person in the crowd. Okay. Uh, the truth of, I think the real truth of that is that we are perfectly capable of both. That's what I think the real truth is. We're perfectly capable of honouring God and we're perfectly capable of hating our brother. We've got both those things coming. And Jesus said, how can you have a sweet water and bitter water coming out of the same stream? You've got to fix the stream. There's a problem in the source of the stream if you've got bitter and sweet coming out. So you've got to fix what's going on in here. The first thing is to recognise that's your condition. That's my condition. We're all like this. I really identify with James and John because as a young man, I was a son of thunder. I was an argumentative, rotten person. Well, I wasn't that rotten. I was quite nice. But I was argumentative, and I was, Heather knows some of this, but I, I, I'd get into it with anybody on anything. It wasn't so physically violent, but I was verbally violent towards people. I would go into church meetings, and I would argue with people just to rip them down. I'd do it nicely under the pretense of religious cover. I knew I wasn't dumb. Uh, under, the, under the religious cover... I would, I would make jabs at people. I remember going into, this is a traditional church, and one of the positions was the choir leader. And I remember, I knew exactly what I was doing, about 18, 19, went into a, a meeting like this, and I suggested that we might have, it might be time for a new choir leader. They were, 
there are gasps. Older people fell with heart attacks as I spoke. But I knew what I was doing. I was having a go at this person I didn't like. Argumentative, horrible, just competitive to the nth degree. My kids will tell you, smash them at Monopoly all the time. They won't play Monopoly with me anymore. <laughs> Your kids got to grow up tough, haven't they? You can't molly coddle them all the way. You know, they got to learn. Oh, me and Mitchell have a go. That'll be good. Competitive, not good. It's okay to be competitive, but to have that aggressive spirit on top of it is really, really bad. So I get, I get what John was saying. And when I was around about 17, 18, God started a process with me of transformation where he really got a hold of me. And I remember being at altar calls, weeping and praying and seeking God because he put a magnifying glass on my heart. And said, you might have grown up in church, you might be a good little boy, you might have already started preaching and leading, but I can see what's in your heart. And it's not so good. Heart trans- So I get what John's saying. There's a heart transformation that has to take place. How are we going to do that? How's that transformation going to take place? Well, the next thing is to receive the love of God. This was the answer that he gave for the Cain and Abel situation in verse 16. 1 John chapter 3, he says, By this we know, love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Just while we're reading that, because we read it nice and quiet in church on a Sunday morning, but we all know that out of the 12 disciples, John was the only one who wasn't killed for his faith. He watched his brother get killed. He watched all his good mates get killed for their faith. He's the only one who lived to an older age, wrote the book of Revelation and so on, but he lived through watching all of his brothers get killed for their faith. So when he says this, this has deep meaning for him. He loved us and he laid down his life for us, so we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. He had seen these guys laying down their lives for him and for the church and the other believers, so he knew what he was talking about. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. He says we've got to have a transformation. If you don't love, you don't know God. If you don't come to him and recognize that he laid down his life for you and he's forgiven you, if you don't have that reception of the love of God in your heart, then you won't change. You'll be just the way you were, but you need to have that change. In John, uh, John's Gospel, chapter 21, verse 20, he identifies himself in the Gospel. But do you remember how he identifies himself? Peter's asking Jesus about him, and he identifies himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. Because for John, the most important thing in his life was he had come from being this violent, aggressive guy to a place where he had received the love of God. And that now, he, that, that was his self-description. I am the disciple who has received the love of God, the disciple that Jesus loved. That was the beginning. And the beginning of our walk with God is the fact that he loves us. He loves us and he gave himself for us. Jesus loves us and he gave his life for us. That's the beginning of our transformation right there. We recognise that we're just as easily Cain as we are Abel. And we say, like John, I need to be transformed. I need to be changed. And the only way I can be changed is by receiving the love of God. We don't start because we're great. We start because he's great. And he loves us and he's given his life for us. So we start by receiving that Don't try to practice a religion of love and say, if I just love everybody, I'll be right with God. No, you've got to get right with God first and then he'll change your heart and increasingly he'll help you to love your wife and love your husband and love your family and all of that. Now, Heather and I have been married 40 years, Nellie, and uh, and, uh, that'll tell you that I got married when I was 20, too young. I'll just say that out before any of you get too excited. Uh, and uh, uh, 40 years, there's plenty of opportunity for God to teach us how to love each other, especially in the bad moments. We don't have bad moments, of course. Well, 
I have some bad moments because Heather's not that great. But, you know, Heather doesn't have bad moments because I'm so good. You know, that's the way it, <laughs> it probably balances up the other way, if I'm truth be told. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's a transformation that takes place through our life. And it begins by recognising I'm not perfect. I'm not able. I'm probably Cain. And I've got a lot of that murder in me. I've got a lot of that you know, animosity and nasty. I've got a lot of that in me. And so I, Jesus, I need your love. I need to receive. You're the one who's loving, not me. I need to receive that love into my heart. Jason and Michaela are getting married next weekend. And, uh, and, of course, we've, we've done all the, the prep and stuff and we've talked about the 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and kind. It's not that Hollywood romance thing. It's the day-to-day, are you kind, are you caring, are you patient, are you loving? Where's that going to come from? Most of the people in our world don't know how to do that. Half the marriages are breaking up, half the, rela- all the, the relationships are shot to pieces. People who live together do worse than those who get married, just by the way. And all of that's going on because we don't know how to love through the hard stuff. And we need help. And the help is found in Jesus. That's what John learned. He thought, if I just stuck with myself, then I'm an argumentative cuss. But Jesus loves me. That's why he identified himself as the disciple who Jesus loved, because that was his great revelation. And then he finishes up. So if you you recognize that you're more of a, maybe you've got plenty of Cain in you, and you say, God, I need to receive your love through Christ. I need to receive that, because it's not just me. Then the last thing he says is you need to now live in that love. Don't try to just receive Jesus and then live out of your own strength because that's not going to work. Don't, you know, got saved one day and now I'm doing, you know, I'll talk to Jesus when I need him later on. No, every day I need to have the help of God to live my life if I'm going to be a loving person, particularly those of us who aren't naturally very kind and gentle. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another... For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God, and get it, and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this is the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his son to be the propitiation or payment for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. John understood that he had plenty of Cain inside of him. He understood that he needed the love of Jesus because it wasn't going to come naturally to him. And he understood that he had to live in that, not as a memory, but as a current reality in his life. That's why every morning I get up and I have to spend time with God. Because of my plantar fasciitis, which is getting so much better, I have to spend five minutes stretching and massaging my foot. If I don't do it every day, then my, my, all my ligaments tighten up and my foot starts hurting. Now that's a pretty simple example, isn't it? Also every day after I've stretched and massage my foot, I go with my coffee and I spend time with God. And I read something from the Word and I let it come into my heart and I pray slowly, not repetitively, I pray through the Lord's Prayer, God be glorified, forgive me, bless our community every day. Why do I do that every day? Because I got plenty of cane in me and I have received the love of Jesus And now I need to learn to live in that love. Galatians 5 tells us that we can choose to either live in the spirit or in the flesh. And the fruit of the spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, etc. Brownie points, pat on the back, whoever says all, all of them at once. Check it with the person beside you. The fruit of the spirit first is love. There are some who interpret that passage to say the fruit of the Spirit is love. And out of that flows joy, all the rest of it. 
I think it's just all the fruit of the Spirit, to be honest. But what it tells us is that our love for each other is going to flow from our life in the Spirit of God. Not a religious thing. A genuine heart transformation in the presence of God. Amen?